has a very interesting song. It always reminds me of a time, a long time ago, when I had been working at this missionary headquarters for maybe three or four months, working 16 or 17 hours a day, seven days a week, shoveling, doing manual labor, cutting wood, and breaking leaves. And I remember how I didn't even have enough money to buy a coat. I was living off of 50 or $60 per month that was being given to me by a small church that I was a part of. And I ended up leaving the place. I felt guilty for it as if I had let down God. And as I lay on my couch, sleeping, despondent, that song came up. It was as if God was singing this song to me. Sparkle, you're so very lovely in my sight. And it seemed that this voice and this message was so far beyond what I had learned about as a God in the church. That all of that struggle, all of those months, all of that pain and suffering had led me to a truth that could not be purchased. The truth that the God that I was following was not one in the box or in the institution or the judge that hated and destroyed people who were not strong, but was the one who cared about those who had a heart and who loved. And so I just wanted to share that with you. I was moved to share that with you as I continue this ministry, I guess you can call it, of helping to heal the world. The title of this sermon is The Best is Yet to Come. If you're anything like I was, you probably heard that you were a beautiful child, just the way you were, for a while anyway. You were told that everything was possible if you just worked hard enough, and if you were honest and caring, then you grew up, and at each stage of your development, you came, became more and more surprised and disillusioned as things just didn't turn out that way for you. Is that correct? Maybe it isn't nowadays. Young people seem to be a bit more savvy nowadays about life than we were when we were young. In the 60s, they at least spared you the truth about the way the world was until you got old enough to handle it. They don't do that now. They have adolescents and pre-adolescents wearing makeup and tight pants so tight they look almost naked. To have little girls with designer hairstyles participating in beauty pageants and little boys and girls working out so much and so hard that their bodies get deformed sometimes and they develop acute disabilities. Why? Their parents want to get a jump on the competition. They want to get a lot of money and pass on the back because of how great their children are. They also want their children to get affirmed and maybe have a bit of money to help them along the way. But in any event, this is a bit damaging. This has always happened, but the beauty pageant thing for babies and so on seems a bit strange to me. Yet again, I come from a different place. The world is much different than when I was young. There is still one thing in common that gets passed on, though. That is an attitude. The attitude is that nothing is free, not even unconditional love. You have to earn it. No one will ever say this outright. Someone came close to it, George Bush, but no one else. We all feel it, though, don't we? We all know it and accept it somewhere deep in our subconscious, or else we fight against it for most of our lives. This is a terrible lesson it is repeated over and over again on TV, radio, and newspapers till we finally believe it and we act on it. We make it happen in our own lives. It isn't the fact that causes the suffering. It is accepting the belief that it is true and investing our time, talent, and resources in ways to reinforce this idea. We make this idea true. I want to suggest another idea, though. A few ideas that can totally free us from the idea that there is nothing free and that we are not good enough. The first idea is, of course, that love 
is free. Love is free or it isn't love at all. There are many people who have said that God is love and that God loves everyone and treats them kindly. How can this be when some people are poor and some people are broken? Some are said to be going to hell to burn forever. How can there be a loving presence that loves everyone equally and unconditionally? I don't know the answers. It's my job to bring up the questions. I'm just joking, actually. We all know the answer. It is just buried under the nonsense that we have been fed most of our lives. The God is who is supposed to love everyone but also punishes and condemns is something made up by a group of people who live like that themselves. There is no God like that. Punishment and reward come from one's actions and reaction to those actions. This, however, is even conditional. In an unrighteous world, any act of righteousness can be perceived as evil. In a righteous world, any act of unrighteousness can be perceived as evil. So what, really, does good and evil have to do with anything? What really matters is if you are able to love yourself enough to accept yourself. Can you look into the mirror and accept what you see? Can you accept what you hear when you think and when you speak? Can you love yourself? If not, that is the main problem that is taking place in your life right now, in everyone's life right now. After being trained to be so dissatisfied and learning that satisfaction will stop us from progress, it is almost impossible to love ourselves the way we are. The only way we can do this is through grace. The biblical definition of grace is unmerited favor. It is the quick realization that allows one to step out of the madness of the society in which we live for just enough time and space to see the truth. This truth shakes us up. It breaks us out of our human form and moves us back to the true self, the original mind, the divine self that dwells within, who is capable of unconditional love. The thing that opens the door to this type of love is love of self, love of larger self and love of smaller ego self. It is treating oneself kindly, caring for one's best interest. For real love is not an emotion, it is an action. It is a feeling so interwoven with action that one cannot exist without the other. Passion and hunger, which can be mislabeled as love in our society, is always around. True love, unconditional love, God love, is something harder to find. We hear about it in religious institutions and organizations that stress higher thought, but many of them have not even attained it themselves. Love, however, is one of the most important things necessary to break us free from the world that those who were born before us created and have drafted us into, especially self-love. This type of love costs you nothing. It is free. The second thing that can help us move beyond this illusion is fearlessness. Fearlessness. Fearlessness is a bit different from being brave. Being brave, I think, is reacting to the challenges that come upon us. It is being able to effectively navigate dangerous territory in the worst of circumstances. A brave person stands up for truth to a certain extent, but sometimes it is a truth that has been pushed by the society through consensus and accepted as the real. It can actually be dangerous, damaging, and oppressive to others. The fearless person, however, is different. The fearless person is able to confront anything with truth as his or her ally or sword.
the fearless person is willing to take that sword of truth and cut the things that hinder truth, growth, and the avenue of love, even if it is a comfortable belief system that he or she has. The fearless person will stand up against our tradition, our social belief, religious beliefs, and the latest scientific findings, if they are not true, just for the sake of being a troublemaker? No, not for that. But for the sake of tearing down the walls that hold us all hostage so we can live in truth. Living in truth and living in joy are synonymous, for it is only when we live in truth that we can see clearly to create a world where love is at the core. It is when living in truth that we can destroy the misinformation, the thoughts, the prejudice, the images planted in our mind that are not true, get rid of all of those isms that we have learned. Even if we believe this misinformation, if we feel it with all of our beings, if we are fearless, we will not care. We will act on what we know to be true and go against our feelings and thoughts to do what is right, thus destroying the old lies and stereotypes. We will develop the power within, the personal power that exists in all of our hearts and will make ourselves, our families, and our communities better places to live. We will manifest the power of God if we love ourselves and live fearlessly. As the writer of Proverbs said, a person who can rule the self can rule the city. The third thing that will help a person free his or herself from the traps of needing to compete to rise to the top through looks, material extensions, or performing better than others to get recognition is knowing when to do action with non-action. In other words, it is doing nothing. What do you mean by doing nothing, you may ask? That is a real no-no in our society, isn't it? You have to do something. I would suggest that we all stop doing and start being who we are, the divine creatures within. We come to recognize that part of ourselves and merge with that part of ourselves when we do nothing. We read books, we see videos, we see posts on Facebook about mindfulness, meditation. For some reason, that is the type of meditation that has received all the PR in the U.S. instead of all the other many forms. Now the scientists are even beginning to cling to it and talk about its benefits. It is being brought into the system now and changed as Vipassana, the original mindfulness meditation, is not as much recognized in the U.S. Mindfulness meditation can be done as a type of mental therapy without attaching the goal of becoming enlightened and it can be socially empowering. Mindfulness sounds a bit better to the Westerner, steeped in the material science tradition, and it can be done in shorter stints to fit more easily in our work schedules. It also sounds cool, you know. Who doesn't want to be mindful? right? That's a good selling point. There are all kinds of techniques that one can partake of while meditating. One can study meditation and become an expert at it, I guess. The truth is, however, that all meditation is, is doing nothing. It consists of sitting there. That's it. If you sit there long enough, you meditate. You won't have a choice. As the old folks used to say when we were children, just sit there and shut up. That sums up meditation. Not only do you shut your mouth, you also shut your thoughts. You stop thinking and you stay quiet watching what happens. You see that your ego is running on automatic pilot and you just sit there and watch it go until it gets tired of going or you get tired 
of it rattling on and on and on. When you get tired of it rattling, you set it up. If you don't know how, you find a way eventually. One way of doing this, doing nothing, will shut it up. Sit and listen to the silence that surrounds the ego. The silence of the universe. If you cannot hear it, just keep listening and you will eventually hear it. It is a silence that is so loud and full that it covers any random thoughts and ideas and gives the ego a chance to shut up. When this mind, the mind that is watching all of the rattling, stops thinking, silence arises automatically. The ego is afraid of death. It is afraid of dissolving and expanding itself. But if we live a life of love, and if we live a fearless life, the ego becomes a lover of humanity and becomes fearless enough to charge ahead and pull us forward into a state of enlightenment and being awake. A state where we are free. Once we taste that freedom, no one can take it away. We realize that all of the stuff we heard at first, that we are beautiful beings and unconditionally loved, is true. We are unconditionally loved by ourselves. We are unconditionally loved by God, the universe, or whatever you might call he, she, or it. We are unconditionally loved by those who are awake, those who love themselves. As for others, as long as they are unable to love themselves unconditionally, excuse me, unconditionally, they won't love others. They will project their fork tongue philosophy onto the world and get those who are unaware to buy into it age after age and generation after generation. But we will no longer buy into it. And we will be able to start the work of bringing together real communities that no longer buy into it. All of this starts just by you being willing to love yourself. If you decide to love yourself, the small self, and the lower self, live a fearless life and do nothing every so often, let me repeat that again. If you decide to love yourself, the small and larger self, live a fearless life and do nothing every so often, you will enter into the reality of joy, bliss, and love that underlies this false world created by the fearful. You will be awake. You will be the love, the God, that you see now and into eternity. Let all of us take that great plunge together. Namaste.